Hi, everyone. My name is Todd Waldron, and I'm a conservationist. I'm from the Adirondacks, and I'm a volunteer with New York Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. We're a nonprofit conservation group that is a voice for New York public lands and waters. Um, I'm also a podcaster, and I host this podcast called The Outdoor Feast by Modern Carnivore. I've also hosted a podcast in the past called East to West Hunting, and we've done about 100 episodes. And it's typically about conservation and getting people outdoors and telling their stories. And the reason I'm so passionate about telling outdoor stories and conservation is because I grew up here in the Adirondacks and the outdoors um, played a major role in my major decisions in life as far as my career, my lifestyle, getting outdoors, somebody that just grew up in a blue collar family, having the opportunity to get out and enjoy a place like the Adirondack Park has been an incredibly shaping experience for my life. And so I've always been passionate about the outdoors and conservation. And I'm thrilled today to be talking with you, sharing some stories about the intriguing history of Eastern elk in the Adirondack Mountains. And so what I find intriguing about this, and maybe you can relate to this, is that for those of us that love the outdoors, and maybe we've seen pictures of elk on the landscape, when we envision the landscapes that elk inhabit in North America, it's typically in the West, right? Um, so we don't typically think of the Adirondack Mountains as being a place where um, elk, which are some of the largest cervids in North America, um, big game animals, um, would thrive, but they have in fact. And so there's a fascinating history behind it and that's what we're talking about. So I'm gonna get going here with the presentation and uh, feel free as we're going through this, like after it's done and everything, if you want to keep in touch, if you have any questions, feel free to email me anytime. My email is todd at modcarn.com, M-O-D-C-A-R-N.com. I'm always glad to hear from you and I hope you like this presentation. So here goes. All right, so what we're talking about again is the, the fascinating history of Eastern elk here in the Adirondack Mountains in New York. And again, my name is Todd Waldron. I'm a forester, I'm a conservationist, I'm host of the Outdoor Feast podcast, and I'm a volunteer for backcountry hunters and anglers in New York. Um, so what's intriguing, like have you ever, let's just talk about this for a second, like when it comes to like stories and like aha moments and everything, have you ever come across this um, information maybe um, kind of circumstantially and it's just like you think to yourself, wow, how did I not know about that sooner? You know, it's something <laughs> that that's kind of how this rabbit hole formed for me in terms of thinking about elk on the landscape here in New York and specifically in the Adirondacks. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that process came to be. Uh, but I do want to give a shout out quickly to conservationist Susan Shea in Brookfield, Vermont. Um, she wrote a piece about this. Um, very topic on the Adirondack Explorer website maybe a year or so ago, probably 2019. And it was just about the time when all of this was kind of coming um, into my interest in, in you know, the, the research that I started doing started getting um, ramped up. And so I want to thank Susan for writing a great article. And I want to give a shout out to her work um, because it's uh, it was informative and it was also one of those things that um, it just helped me um, help me get moving on this and and doing my own research and finding things out. So, okay, so we're talking about North American elk here, and this is not an elk. We all know that this is a white-tailed deer, and this is uh, when you think of big game animals in New York State. This is our most popular big game animal. Uh, we see these, uh, there's a healthy population of deer. They're all over the place, all the counties of New York, um, other than, you know, really heavy urban areas. And, um, and so, you know, this is our favorite big game animal. It's not an elk. Here's another one, uh, Alces Alces, our, our moose here. And we have probably 600 moose in New York State uh, right now, according to some research and some studies that DEC is doing. But this is not an elk, and this is not what we're talking about here today. They are on the landscape. And this definitely isn't an elk. <laughs> so you get the drip. I think this picture was taken out in Yellowstone in Wyoming. 
So here's what we're talking about, North American elk. And so, you know, these, when you picture elk like this, you typically think of the Rocky Mountain states, places like Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, Colorado. Um, many of you've probably heard of bugle before. I've got a bugle tube here. And um, this is just something I'm going to demonstrate my version of what an elk bugle, a male bugle might sound like. Um, so here goes. So I brought the bugle to share that and also to keep you awake during the presentation. So <laughs> hope you like that. Um, North American elk, six subspecies uh, across North America. Four of them are still extant. Two of them are extinct. The Miriam's elk in the Southwest and the Eastern elk, which we're talking about here today. Uh, so currently they're distributed across the mountain West and into Eastern US in places like Kentucky, Virginia, um, North Carolina, Tennessee, definitely Pennsylvania. Those are reintroduction efforts um, from Rocky Mountain elk that took place in the early 20th century. And we're going to talk about the reintroduction efforts and the players involved in the Adirondack region as we move through this process. So elk are huge animals. They're up to 700 pounds. Um, there's currently a population of about a million elk. Most of them are in the West. This is a picture, by the way, of um, a trip that I took with my hunting partner, Jeff Jones. This is in the West Needle Mountains outside of Durango, Colorado. And that's what I think of when I'm thinking of elk habitat. Um, that trip was in 2018, I think. So how did I go down this rabbit hole? Well, what happens like a lot of things in life is it was kind of circumstantial. And I'm gonna tell you, it was just one of those days where I had walked in, I live in Chestertown, New York, in the Adirondacks, and I'd walked into one of my favorite stores, which is Crossroads General Store. And I've been in this place uh, a few hundred times over the years. And for some reason, I never noticed this picture on the shelf as you walk in into the store. But that day, I happened to catch it. And I, I thought to myself, how in the world did I never see this picture? And what are we talking about here that the last elk shot in Essex County, New York, in the Adirondacks was in 1946 when my dad's alive. I didn't even know there were elk in the Adirondacks, let alone the fact that the last one was shot in 1946. How can this be? That kind of thing. And so this picture was taken on the Northwoods Club up in Minerva. Uh, it was featured in Time Magazine. There's some game wardens here from Scroon Lake and Elizabethtown in the picture. Um, also some forest rangers from Scroon Lake and Ticonderoga, Chilson Hill. And so this really piqued my interest and I just knew that I had to learn more about it. And at the same time, like I had mentioned earlier, uh, Susan Shea's article came out about elk in the Adirondacks on Adirondack Explorer. And so it just kind of set this whole stage for this intriguing um, thing. And I just knew I wanted to learn more about it and share more about it and do some research. So Todd, you mean that elk once lived here in the Adirondacks? And, and that's exactly what I'm saying. Yes, it's, it's really an improbable tale. And there's two stories that we're gonna talk about through this. Um, there's the original Eastern elk, and they were the elk that inhabited the Eastern United States prior to European contact for the most part. They were extirpated here by the mid to late 1800s, but at one point, um, elk, the subspecies Eastern elk, um, did inhabit the Eastern Adirondacks um, in the Eastern United States, and they were, um, you know, they were all over the place. Um, and then, you know, we're also going to talk about their, their eventual decline and extinction in the East and in New York, and then some 20th century reintroductions of Rocky Mountain elk, a subspecies from the Rockies, and how those things went as well. So there's two stories. There's the original Eastern elk, and then there's the introductions in the 1900s, and they're both fascinating stories. And so this is a picture from a book um, from Elk Management. It's North American Elk Ecology and Management, Jack Ward Thomas. And what this is, is showing the Eastern elk distribution in general distribution of elk uh, prior to the Europeans. And so you can see on the screen, the distribution goes way up into the Canadian provinces up here, Manitoba, Alberta, and um, all across the West, all across the Midwest, Minnesota, um, Wisconsin, Illinois, and then the Appalachians. And you can see New York is right here as well. Um, and so that, you know, Ernest Thompson Seton from uh, the Boy Scouts, he was the founder of the Boy Scouts. Um, he had thought 
that prior to pre-European contact, there was something like 10 million elk distributed across the, uh, the North America. Um, I don't really know. Like, what's one of the things that's intriguing about this story to me is the fact that um, what we're finding is that we, yes, we see remains that I'm going to be talking about. Yes, there were sightings that were documented. Yes, we're finding things like elk antlers and elk bones and elk awls and all of that stuff. Uh, but we don't really know how many there were in New York, and we don't really know how abundant they were. And, um, you know, and that's what really intrigues me as much as the fact that they were here is just trying to figure out how abundant they were. And so if they were abundant, you know, we don't really see a lot of records um, in, you know, documented in things like, uh, well, like Native Americans, Iroquois villages and stuff like that. You know, you don't really hear a lot about them eating elk and it being a major food source, but it definitely, they were here. But we're not talking about abundance. We're just talking for today's purposes about the fact that they were on this landscape. Uh, the abundance is a whole different rabbit hole and something I'm working on um, further. So Eastern elk sightings and documentation. So going far back, Ernest Thompson Seton wrote a book, Life Histories of North, Northern Animals. And here's one, um, the French explorer Jacques Cartier, 1535, going back, you know, uh, 470 years or so. Um, Jacques Cartier was one of the original explorers that came up the St. Lawrence um, as far as Montreal. And on his return in his journals, he reported great stores of stags, deer, and bears. So this is going back 470 years. And the stags are what we're talking about here with elk. Um, again, Champlain, Samuel D. Champlain, the namesake of Lake Champlain, um, he's in Kingston, Ontario, along the St. Lawrence River, and, um, you know, he's showing, he's referencing elk and elk stag being there in 1632. Father Lemoyne, uh, who was a, I think he was a Jesuit priest, but um, voyaging on the St. Lawrence River, a few leagues above Montreal, found great droves of wapiti, which is another word for elk. And Moving over, um, other documentation that we have here, Oliver Perry Hay, um, who was a like an anthropologist and naturalist. He wrote uh, Finds of Cervus Canadensis in the Pleistocene of Eastern North America, meaning Eastern Elk, uh, the Racket River, St. Lawrence County, uh, J.E. Decay, 1842, uh, described part of a skull with damaged antlers of elk. Uh, by the way, what's interesting is that um, John James Audubon had a print of Eastern Elk. The only print I've ever seen of Eastern Elk uh, was a John James Audubon print, uh, for, uh, and he had done one. And Eastern Elk were thought to be a larger subspecies body-wise uh, from their Rocky Mountain cousins. Um, but um, you can look that up online. It's pretty interesting to see a picture of what an Eastern Elk might look like. Uh, but we're seeing that there were definitely places where people are picking things up. There's documentations. Here's one in, in the Adirondacks, Boonville, Oneida County, Seahart uh, Miriam. Anybody, I don't know if you know who Seahart Miriam was, but he was born in Boonville. And he ended up being um, the first director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, it, for nationally. So um, he ended up being a, a major conservationist. His sister was also a major conservationist and she wrote one of the first birding books out there. I think her name was Florence Miriam. Um, and she wrote a book uh, about birding and it was one of the first ones out there. So they were both from the Adirondacks and the, the Western side over by Boonville. Here's a reference though, had parts of elk horns plowed up in an old beaver meadow. So there's definitely a lot of documentation here. Third Lake, Fulton Chain, Herkimer County. We're talking about old forge here. Hart Miriam stated that he'd seen a number of elk antlers in a bog. So these are all Pleistocene elk. These are all the original elk way before Eastern European contact, but we're seeing documentation of the fact that they definitely were here coming out of the Pleistocene. We don't know how many, but they were here and they were scattered throughout the area. It's fascinating. And here's one, Steele's Corner, St. Lawrence County, Dr. C.C. Benton of Ogdensburg, had parts of elk antlers discovered at the place named Steel, Steel Corners. Is it time for another bugle? I have too many, uh, too many slides in there with a lot of uh, references from books. So here goes. <laughs> 
Okay, breaking things up a little bit. Back to back to the references. Okay, Eastern Elk Sightings and Documentation. So Hart Merriam in his book, The Mammals of the Adirondack Region, um, Northeastern New York. It's thought that the elk were probably here until about 1842. This is the last reference in the Adirondacks of any anybody seeing elk. But basically, he's writing here in his book, and he says, when the species was exterminated here is not known, Dr. Decay, um, who worked, I think, for the New York State Museum, or he was like a, a major like archaeologist or anthropologist, or, you know, he's a major researcher, uh, James Decay, was writing in 1842, states that the stag is still found in the state of New York, but very sparingly, and will doubtless be extirpated before many years. Uh, and here again, Mr. Beach, this is a reference from his book, another hunter, Mr. Beach, an intelligent hunter on the Racket River, assured me that in 1836, he shot a stag, or as he called it, an elk on the north branch of the Saranac River. So we're talking up like Clinton County up by Plattsburgh. And so what happened is it's generally thought that in terms of Eastern elk um, in the Adirondacks in New York and beyond, that it's generally thought that they were overhunted, there was no regulation, um, and that probably by about 1867, the last known elk in the Eastern US was harvested in Pennsylvania by Jim Jacobs. Um, incidentally, there's some controversy around this claim because there's a guy named John Decker from the Pleasant Gap area near State College who also claims to have shot the last elk in Pennsylvania in like 1877. But the, but the bigger point is, is that um, through the 1800s, once the European contact took place um, in New York and beyond, if you look at a lot of the research that Oliver Perry um, Hay had done, um, it just seems like what was happening is uh, exploitation. They're killing the animals for food. Um, there's no regulation at this point for hunting seasons because it's early in the 1800s. And so by the 1870s or so, elk are pretty much off the eastern landscape and, and gone. And I think the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or its predecessor declared eastern elk extinct um, sometime around 1880, I think. So there's this period of an absence of elk on the landscape here in New York that's, you know, 60, 70, 80 years. And so they're gone. They've been overhunted. And then what happens is by the late 1880s and 1890s, we're going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to talk about reintroductions. And so when we're talking about reintroductions, there's really three people that are the key uh, players here in the East for reintroducing elk on the landscape. And the first one was Austin Corbin and his Blue Mountain Preserve in Croydon, New Hampshire, Austin Corbin um, was a very wealthy person. He had made a lot of money down in um, New York City, and um, he was originally from New Hampshire. He built the 26,000 acre Blue Mountain Preserve, and we're going to talk a little bit about what he did and where the elk came from and so forth. Uh, the second player that we need to know about as far as major players for the history of Eastern Elk is William C. Whitney and his October Mountain Preserve. William Whitney was the Secretary of the Navy, by the way. And also, you know, if you've heard of the Whitney estate, uh, Mary Lou Whitney, the Whitney family, all of that, you know, tied into that. And so he had a place in the, in the Berkshires called the October Mountain Preserve in Lenox, Mass. And he also was a major landowner here in the Adirondacks. And so he was a player as well of bringing elk back into New York um, in the early 1900s. And then the, the third player um, that was really interesting that sh you should know about is Carlton Richardson at the Indian Rock Game Preserve in West Brookfield, Mass. We'll talk a little bit about all three of these folks. So Austin Corbin, Blue Mountain Preserve, Croydon, New Hampshire. He was a railroad tycoon. Um, he built this estate. It was like a fenced game preserve, 26,000 acres over by White River Junction in, um, in, in New Hampshire, central New Hampshire. And what's interesting is um, he sourced 60 elk from northern Minnesota in the late 1880s to put on his preserve. Now, incidentally, he also had bison. He had a whole host of other species. He had um, wild boars from Germany and like all sorts of game, um, both that were, um, you know, native to North America and not. And so he wasn't solely elk. Uh, 
But the 60 elk that he got from northern Minnesota in the late 1880s kind of formed his herd there. And then they were a part of the reintroduction efforts here in New York in the early 1900s. Um, he died in a carriage accident in New Hampshire, by the way. He was pretty young. And then his son, Austin Corbin, I think the third, um, carried on a lot of the conservation legacy. Um, there's a whole side story to this, um, this fact that there were 60 elk from northern Minnesota. Uh, because like what I had said earlier in the presentation is, is that we think the last Eastern elk went extinct in 1880. It's not really known. Eastern elk did live in Minnesota. Um, and so they were um, native to Minnesota and the prairies and the woodlands. Um, so it could be that there were actually Eastern elk bloodlines that came back. But the fact is by the late 1880s, the elk in Minnesota were so far up in the Northwest, it's really, we're not sure if they were actually Eastern elk or if they were Manitoban elk. So I don't think we'll ever really know. Uh, it's an interesting sideline though. Okay, William C. Whitney, October Mountain Preserve, Secretary of the Navy, 14,000 acres, which is now a, a state forest, I believe in Western Mass, if you go over to Lenox, um, you'll see the story uh, and the, the landscape there and it's actually public land. I think most of the elk that um, William Whitney had sourced probably came from the Jackson Hole area in Wyoming in the early 1900s. And again, Whitney was a major landowner up in the central Adirondacks. Um, there's still remnants of the Whitney estate up between Long Lake and Tupper Lake. And so um, he had uh, an estate over in Massachusetts and a lot of elk there. And he was moving some elk over here into the Adirondacks working with um, the department of uh, what's now DEC in the early 1900s um, on some reintroduction efforts. Carlton Richardson, Indian Rock Game Preserve, West Brookfield, Mass. Um, now here's the story that's fascinating with him. I don't believe that any of Richardson's elk actually came to the Eastern Adirondacks, uh, but he did send 12 elk to New Zealand as a gift from President Roosevelt in 1905. So here's where this story gets interesting. Those elk were believed by some people. I've seen some references um, out there that some people believe those elk were from Minnesota. So it's possible after Austin Corbin died that some of his Minnesota elk went down to Carlton Richardson's place in Massachusetts. Totally plausible, but I've not been able to connect the dots. Um, the, the intriguing thing here is, were they the last remnants of Eastern elk in North America? We don't really know. Um, it's fascinating. If they came from Minnesota, if they were Eastern elk, it's possible that there's bloodlines of native eastern elk that have been mixed with stags in New Zealand today, but the but the bloodlines have been so genetically altered and and just like watered down that we'll really never know to tell the truth. So what happens is um, here's a, an article referenced by C. W. Severinghouse. I think he was with um, the the predecessor of D. E. C. Uh, but he wrote an article uh, called The Failure of Elk to Survive in the Adirondacks. But basically what happens is about the turn of the century, um, if like I've looked at a lot of research from the fishing game reports from New York um, in 1900 through maybe 1910. And so um, there was a lot of references in those reports that are available publicly at the State Museum or at the library. Uh, you can read them yourself. But there's a lot of references to how elk were doing in the reintroduction of elk um, in the Adirondacks. And then Severinghouse wrote a book about elk in the early 1900s, why they failed to survive. Um, but in that, here's some references to some of the locations that those eastern elk were relocated. So Forked Lake up in uh, Hamilton County near um, Racket Lake and Long Lake, those elk probably came from October Mountain Preserve. Um, from William Whitney. Racket Lake, same thing. Litchfield Park up near Tupper Lake had elk. I'm not sure where those elk came from. The Whitney Preserve in Long Lake, October Mountain. So those were elk that William Whitney worked with DEC on to, to introduce back here to this area. Um, interestingly, Tongue Mountain, right outside of uh, Silver Bay on Lake George, had some elk reintroduced in the early 1900s from Blue Mountain Preserve from Austin Corbin's. So it's possible that those were some Minnesota elk that were reintroduced. Uh, the Nahasani estate, 66 elk came from Wyoming. Harris Lake up in Newcomb, Blue Mountain Preserve. DeBar Mountain up in the Northern Adirondacks, Blue Mountain Preserve. Bay Pond Park up north of Tupper Lake, uh, Big Moose Lake, 
and Woodruff Pond at some elk. So there was this extensive reintroduction effort of elk coming back into the Adirondack region from about 1900 to 1910. And so much so that according to Severinghouse, that by 1906, the estimated elk population in the Adirondacks was 350. So they were doing pretty well. Um, now, what's interesting is, is that there, for some, for numerous reasons, ultimately these populations declined from 1910, say, to about 1946 when the last elk was harvested. Part of it was habitat, part of it was mortality, it could have been disease, part of it was just hunting, you know. But there was a, an elk population of 350, which isn't inconsequential. I mean, they were around. And another thing you have to consider is that time is like from a habitat standpoint is um, if you think about what the Adirondack Mountains might have looked like in 1910, um, they were a lot of young growth forests. Like when we think of the big woods today, we think of um, the forest preserve and these big white pines and the spruce and fir and maturing forests and older growth. Well, you know, most of that second growth forest, there was extensive logging. And so the habitat that those elk were inhabiting and the deer were inhabiting at that point was very, very different than what we think of today. It was an entirely different forest structure. It was younger, it was more open. Um, there was probably some grass and stuff growing. So that may have been um, conducive to the elk, but as the forest closed in, the habitat probably um, wasn't as ideal for elk, which are grazers, not browsers. So there was an elk reported uh, killed in Santa Clara, 1933. And again, the last elk was harvested on the Northwoods Club in 1946. And um, as late as 1953, uh, there were sightings on uh, the Dunbar Mountain Refuge up by Misham Lake in the winter of 52 and 53. And there was also um, a sighting near Marcy Swamp of a cow elk um, in 1953 by somebody that was hiking in that region. That wasn't that long ago, folks. My dad was alive in 1953. And so that's really fascinating that, to think that there were elk sightings at this point. But by that time, there were a lot of changes going on and they, um, they eventually declined and nobody's seen any authentic record of wild elk here since 1953. So modern elk reintroduction efforts in the Eastern US. Um, so elk have been successfully reestablished in neighboring states like Pennsylvania, and then down into the Appalachians, West Virginia, Kentucky, and other states. And so in, in fact, so, so much that there are actually lottery draw hunting seasons in Pennsylvania and in Kentucky. Kentucky, by the way, has one of the biggest populations of elk in the Eastern US, somewhere around 10,000. Um, interestingly enough, in 1998, New York Department of Environmental Conservation did a feasibility study for elk reintroductions in the Catskills not the Adirondacks up here, but down in the Catskills in, um, in like the Western Catskills area, like Delaware County, Sullivan County. And the long story short is, is it didn't fly, it didn't get enough public support. Um, there was an interest, but like the, some of the concerns were about traffic accidents, insurance, farm damage, community support. So um, that, that they're actually in other states, it's been wildly successful, but not uncontroversial. Um, and so here in New York, there has been some chatter, but, you know, it's not something that has been, um, has been moving forward and there's nothing on the radar right now, uh, for a wild elk herd reintroduction in New York. You can go down to Benazette, um, and, and down into Elk County, PA and see some elk. And it's a fascinating, uh, tour. If you ever want to do that, there's nothing like going to, uh, Western PA in September and hearing elk bugle. Will they ever be again um, an elk population in New York? Who knows? Nothing on the radar. But the fact that they were here, the fact that they were, you know, native to this area into the eastern U.S. prior to European contact, uh, the fact that there were introduction, reintroduction efforts is a fascinating history. And for those of us that love the outdoors and that love conservation, um, it's intriguing to think of those possibilities. And also to learn from, you know, the, the successes and failures of trying to reintroduce species um, and how it goes and what the factors are, things like mortality, public opinion, all that kind of stuff, habitat. So um, I hope you find that as interesting as I do.
And I just want to thank you for joining. Um, you know, the, the questions that are still in my mind about all of this are ones of, I, like I pointed to, um, the, the research that I want to do more about is just like how many elk were here. You know, I've spent some time down at the State Museum. I've done a lot of reading about Eastern Indian and woodland cultures and their food habits. And they ate a lot of deer meat. They ate a lot of fish. You know, they ate a lot of berries. They were omnivores. Um, I don't hear a lot about woodland Indians having a major diet of elk. And so what intrigues me about that then is, does that mean that they, there was just easier pickings with the deer and other food? Or does that mean that they're really, you know, the elk were here, but they were more transient and not as abundant? I don't really know. That's something I want to learn more about. The other thing is, um, while I have this alcohol from Lamoka Lake, you don't see a lot of elk bones in, in um, village sites that have been excavated in a lot of places. There, there's randomly some elk bones, but not as many as like deer and other mammals um, that they may have relied on for food, the woodland Indians, that is. So does that mean that just, you know, is there a reason because of that? Because elk were much larger and they were leaving bones at the kill site. They weren't like dragging a deer into their village. You know, a deer smaller so they could have dragged the deer into the village and the bones could have been used for tools and implements. Maybe elk, they were just butchering on site. Um, we'll never know, uh, but that's the research that I want to continue on. And um, I hope you like this uh, presentation and please reach out. If you would, please, if you like this kind of stuff, check out the Outdoor Feast podcast, Modern Carnivore. You can find it at modcarn.com. Please support New York backcountry hunters and anglers. Um, if you use public lands and waters, whether you hunt fish or not, uh, New York backcountry hunters and anglers is a voice for keeping public lands um, abundant and accessible and healthy. And uh, I want to thank you for your time. Hope you have a great day and look forward to doing this again.